Hello everybody, Ryan Kurzak here of Asheville Vedic Astrology. Uh, we're continuing on with a short series where we're exploring how to best learn astrology, specifically Vedic astrology, although I imagine this will be applicable to all kinds of astrology. Uh, before we get into our topic today, I think it's going to be kind of a lengthy one, I do have a few announcements to make. The spring semester is concluding at Asheville Vedic Astrology, and the fall semester will begin, I believe it's September, maybe late August. But anyway, we have about four, a 14-session series scheduled for this fall. If you go to AshevilleVedicAstrology.com, it's a webinar, so you can participate from pretty much anywhere in the world. Uh, there's 24 spaces left. Now, the people who are currently participating in the uh, spring semester, um, they have first dibs on that. But uh, I do believe there will be room, and if I need to, if I need to, I can expand the class, I believe. I'll do some research on that. So go to AshvalVedicAstrology.com. We're going to be focusing a lot on Jaimini principles, um, Lajatadi Avashtas, uh, timing, how to put all those together with dashas and transits. But you can see the full syllabus if you go to AshvalVedicAstrology.com. And I believe it's the third article over. Maybe I'll put an, a new announcement on there. But it's under the spring and fall semester classes. Okay, good. Oh, and um, two other things to keep in mind is that this summer, in between the spring semester and fall semester, Karen White and I are going to be doing an eight-week webinar. Again, you can participate from anywhere in the world, um, specifically on the Atmakarka and relationships. So Jaimini's Atmakarka and how it relates to relationships. And then in the winter, uh, Michael Reed and I will be doing a class on the nakshatras. It'll be a nine-week class. So keep all this in mind. And if you want to be put on the notification list, um, don't hesitate to contact us, and we can get you all set, set up and arranged. Now, back to how to learn astrology. Now, why did I want to do this video? Well, a number of people have been asking me about this process because they're learning, they're making some progress, but they want a more streamlined approach. And personally, I like to streamline things. Um, I taught a class about two weeks ago, a weekend class, 25-hour class, to a massage school speaking to Ayurveda and astrology. And it occurred to me during that time that it's very important to start with the basics. Because so many people try to learn astrology, and they get books, and they don't quite understand techniques, or they've never had anyone really point out to them how to use or put together certain techniques, and they end up either coming to wrong conclusions, or they become so scattered that they can't quite zero in and figure out what's actually going on in a person's chart. So the first thing we got to consider is what is a good approach to prevent this from happening, so that you can be good at what you do from the very beginning. Well, in the beginning, you have to read books. See the previous video, the very last video I did on 11 of the books that I find to be most helpful for you? Because that's going to start to get the terminology and the information in your mind and your consciousness. You need to read as many books as possible. Good books, hopefully, but as many books as possible so that you become used to thinking like an astrologer. People who write books typically are astrologers. They think like an astrologer, so they write like an astrologer. And it's a whole different way of thinking than you might be used to. You have to be able to have abstract capacity as well as concrete literal capacity. You have to be able to think symbolically as well. And you have to hold within your mind numerous variables. And that's very important because astrology, when you're trying to figure something out in a person's chart, there are a confluence of variables to consider. It's like an equation. And you have to understand what each one of those variables mean in order to get the right information. And that's where a lot of people make mistakes because you know, they'll say something like, um, surely I'm not in the Venus Dasha because uh, I'm definitely having a K2 Saturn experience. Well, if they would go and they would read Brihat Parashar Horashastra and what the Dasha of Venus can give and what the Dasha of K2 can give, well, they can both give good things. So it's not just these things that we've been filling our heads with that aren't based on... Um, what's actually in some of these old books and some of these old teachings. So we have to be able to understand and know all the variables. And if we think about um, the dashas, well, again, 
Maybe Venus is good in your chart, in your Rashi, your birth chart, but maybe it's debilitated in eight of your Vargas. So if we've read Sarvarta Chintamani specifically, we know that uh, the more a planet is debilitated throughout the Vargas, doesn't matter how good it is in the birth chart, it's not going to function that well. And we can have a difficult planet in the birth chart, but maybe it's exalted in Rula Trucona throughout all of the um, Vargas, and so it's going to work better. So this is just one example of these different layers that a lot of people don't consider, and so therefore they come to wrong conclusions, and then that's why astrology is a mess in regards to being able to have an intelligent conversation with someone about it. Um, but anyway, that aside. So there's so much to learn, so much to know. For example, when someone says, tell me about my wealth. Well, I look at the second house. I look at the Lord of the second house. I look at planets Rashi aspect in the second house. I look at planets with the second Lord. I look at planets aspect in the second Lord. I look at the second Lord throughout all of the Vargas. I specifically focus on the Hora, the Chattertamsha. Um, I consider what dasha the person is in. I consider transits over the second house or the second lord. I consider, are there any lajitati avashtas impacting that second house? I consider, were the baladi avashtas impacting um, the lord of that second house? And we can go on a little bit further. Uh, that's as much as I can remember off the top of my head, but that's just to look at wealth. And that's not taking into consideration the fifth or the eleventh house as well, which are also wealth-producing houses nor is that taken into consideration the Ascendant by itself, because the Ascendant has to be strong, just like the Atmakarika has to be strong, in order for uh, the, you, a person um, to have the capacity to actually make the best of the good things within their chart. So if the Ascendant Lord is weak, well, it doesn't matter how good the Yogas are in their chart, they might not be able to manifest it. Same thing, a person can have difficult positions within their chart, difficult everything that we just went over, uh, but they might have a strong Ascendant Lord or a strong Atmakarika, so they can deal with those things better. This is just one, what I might consider to be a superficial layer of what you need to look at in order to read a chart well. Uh, a lot of people contact me and they'll say things like, as I mentioned earlier, I can't be in this dasha because I'm definitely experiencing Jupiter instead of Mercury when all they're looking at is the Rashi. They're not considering any of these other things that I just talked about. <laughs> or someone might write and say, well, my moon sign has to be in, uh, uh, as I used in the previous video, like the Revati Nakshatra or Ashwini Nakshatra. It has to be in that Nakshatra because I relate so much to it. But there can be other reasons why you relate to the energies of that Nakshatra that has nothing to do with the Nakshatra. You know, one example that I gave a while back was when people started writing to me in this way. I actually went and got my Nakshatras book out, the one we talked about in the previous video, and um, Dennis Harness's Nakshatras book out, and I read all of the Nakshatras at once to figure out um, how many of those do I relate to. And I related to about nine of them fairly strongly, and at least six or so, so of those, I, I didn't even have any planets in that Nakshatra. Uh, so we can see here that it's really easy to say something is happening or you're having a particular experience because that's all you know, not because you don't know the rest. And this is why we need to have a good foundation in astrology. So you need to read about the nakshatras. You need to learn about all the avashtas. You need to learn about the vargas, how the vargas work. You need to know how the um, dashas work. And there's more than just the Vimshotari Dasha. There's the Ashtatari Dasha, the Shodashatari Dasha. There's, there's numerous conditional Dashas which are very applicable um, to people based on how the chart is set up. So keep all this in mind. That's why the first couple years of learning astrology, you need to just get in your mind the basics. You need to get in your mind the principles, the techniques. Because once you do that, then you have all the variables. Now you can actually look at a chart and say, all right, let's see how many of these variables we can find confluence with. And then you're more likely to get more accurate information. Um, before I really started looking at a chart, meaning to the point where I, I had a little bit of comfort in doing a decent job, and even then I was terrible, uh, it was about four years after I started studying astrology. Um, at about the five-year mark, I still didn't think I was that good, but people kept asking me for sessions. 
Uh, so my astrology practice kind of went from studying, it was more of a spiritual path for me, to just trying to do a few sessions, to having people ask me to do more sessions. And initially I was a massage therapist, craniosacral therapist. Um, I was involved more in alternative healing. And what happened was in time, more people were asking me to do ast astrology sessions than they were to do the body work. And I was actually decent at the body work. So that's how I segued from the work I was doing to being a full-time astrologer. It, it happened organically, it happened naturally. And I think it's better to approach it that way uh, because then the learning is more of a sattvic uh, state. It's sattvic learning. What does that mean? Well, when you learn in a tamasic way, you're doing something because you're in pain or because you want to prove yourself or whatever it might be. And so you're learning something to kind of make yourself feel better about yourself. And we all do this with different things, so it's not a judgment on anyone's part. Rajasic learning is because you want to be the best, because you want to transform yourself and others. Um, so it's, it's very intense transformational energy. Sattvic learning and sattvic practice, you do it because you can't help it, because you love it, because you're inspired to do it for no other reason. We could go on and on about this, but the more sattvic your approach to learning astrology, um, I think the better understanding you'll have because you'll see the bigger picture. You'll see the bigger picture overall. But anyway, let's get back here. So books, that's number one. Read as many books as you can. Start with that. That way, when you finally find a teacher or you finally start taking classes, you will have a good idea of what a teacher is talking about, hopefully, or you know, a particular subject that's the class is reviewing. So books first. Um, on this channel, many of you already know this, there's a free 52 session introduction to Vedic astrology series. It goes through um, it goes through the art and science of Vedic astrology. Not all of it, but it goes through quite a bit of it so that you get to read the book as well as hear someone discuss and talk about the principles that are within the book and how to use them, how to apply them. So there's some free, there's quite a lot of uh, affordable free learning um, tools available to you. So once you get done with books, then you do want to move on to classes. Uh, you want to find a teacher, someone that you resonate with, that maybe you've read one of their books or seen one of their videos or heard them talk somewhere, but someone that you feel a rapport with so that you can learn how they became an astrologer. They can refer you to specific books. They can tell you, okay, you need to focus on these fundamentals first. And you have to listen to them. That's sort of the big issue. Everyone thinks that they know how to do it themselves. And that's why, again, I feel we have some difficulty in regards to having an intelligent conversation um, between uh, people studying astrology. But find a teacher that you can learn from. And don't worry about who's the best, because we can get into that kind of contest for years and years on end. And really, what I've found is it comes down to what is your rapport with the individual. If they do a good job, if they're sincere, if they really want to help you, um, if you're able to understand how they communicate, that's the teacher you want. So it's not about who's better, who's best. It's simply about... I want to learn from someone who knows what they're doing. So find someone who knows what they're doing. How do you find that person? Well, um, maybe talk to people who've gotten sessions with astrologers. Maybe you get a session with an astrologer. Uh, maybe you've learned something from some of their books and you see how it works. So you always want to just pay attention to the person you're learning from. And don't just decide that you're going to learn from someone because they seem to be world famous or well known. That's really a poor judge of... Uh, astrological skills. One of the most amazing astrologers that I've ever had sessions with, uh, he's passed, and he is the co-author of the Art and Science of Vedic Astrology books, Richard Fish. Um, I don't know how many people really knew about him other than in his little community, um, but he was one of the best astrologers I'd ever known. The things that he told me, that he, he lived in the UK, I lived here in the US, so we did see each other, we did get together from time to time when he would come to the US and I'd go to the UK, but we didn't have a whole lot of interpersonal interaction. So the things that he could tell me about my chart and my family's charts um, with knowing hardly anything about us completely blew my mind, which is why I studied with him. But he was not a, a famous astrologer. Um, he was a good astrologer. That's, that's what was important.
find a teacher, take some classes. There's plenty of courses online um, beginning in 2016. I'm going to start with the Brihat Parashar Horashastra manual and start at the very beginning and teach it on this YouTube channel from the very beginning clear through because I, I feel that that needs to be done because once a person can study something like Brihat Parashar Horashastra and have it explained in an up-to-date fashion um, you will see the scope and the immensity of astrology and then in my mind, you've got a really excellent foundation to do good astrology. And all these books that I talked about in the last class, especially the modern books, they're all based off of Brihat Parashar Hora Shastra, or Jaimini, or maybe Sarvarta Chintamani. There's numerous books that uh, modern authors base their work off of, but it all comes from these older um, prime texts. And when you take classes, take your time with the classes. The biggest mistake I see people making is that they go from one class to the next class to the next class without really learning what they're supposed to from that first class. There's so many techniques, it's so overwhelming that you feel like you're going to miss out on something if you don't keep taking more and more classes. But again, remember this, you have to build a good foundation before you put a first floor and a second floor and a third floor on. If your foundation's weak, none of these other floors are going to stand up to the test of time. So don't get in the impatience race where you feel like you're missing out or you're moving too slowly you're moving as slowly as you need to and once you have the fundamentals of a particular technique down then move on to another technique once you have a particular building block you feel comfortable with it in your mind then you move on because that's when you can put it all together and it's going to make more sense so take your time with classes uh, for example, on astralvedicastrology.com, there's going to be about 11 classes, uh, MP3 classes available um, that I have done over these past three or four years. So they're downloadable classes. Some of them are very basic. Like right now, there is a, a Astrology 101 focusing on uh, Ayurvedic principles and also chart interpretation. Uh, before the end of the year, there will be... Um, Astrological Principles 1, 2, and 3, which focuses on planets, aspects, Rashi aspects, cusps, specific ways to use this basic information to get good information. And then it moves on to Lajitadi. There's a class on Lajitadi Avashtas, a class on how to read the Desumption and the Navamsha, a class specifically on Prajna, on the myth and magic of Vedic astrology, on the Vimshotari Dasha system, and even a 16-hour video class step-by-step -step on how to read a chart. But all of these are good, but you want to take your time with them. So study one at a time, review it multiple times until you feel comfortable, and then move on to the next one. And then you've got more, uh, more of a chance to become a good astrologer. This is one of the reasons why, at this point in time, I'm not a, a very good fan of, um, or a very big fan of um, certification programs. Because what happens with certification programs? You commit to so much time, you spend so much money at the end of a year, two years, or five years. Um, someone puts your name on a website and says you're now a level three astrologer. What does that mean? Um, some people will use that and utilize it very well. But a lot of people, they just went through the motions and they regurgitated what they needed to, but they don't know how to put these things together. So um, I'm sure there are good certification programs out there. I don't personally know of any. I've never done any certification programs. I learned by reading books. I learned by studying uh, with astrologers that I know were good. I learned by making a whole bunch of mistakes. I learned by um, taking classes. And in time, that gave me the capacity to read a chart, I think, in an average fashion. Compared to what's possible, um, I'm probably just an average astrologer. Um, the good astrologers, they will definitely blow your mind with the things that they know. And it, there's always a scale. Um, for example, when I went and taught that class, the Ayurvedic class, the things that I know now, after 15 years of studying and practicing astrology, it seems so easy to me to list all these things that you have to look at. But it, it's hard for a beginner just to conceptualize, okay, so the ruler of the third is in the fourth, and the ruler of the eighth is in the sixth, and you know, like that in and of itself is a stretch. So always remember, there is a there is a quite a wide range of um, 
quite a large range of astrological capacity. And what I have found is that sincerity plays a big role in it too, because it may be that all you know is the, the bhava yogas, but someone comes to you and they ask you a question, and it just so happens that's all you need to know. So we need to keep in mind that there is a, a vast ocean of astrology, and the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know, and it's a very humbling experience. But it's a very good experience because it gives you a lot of self-knowledge. It stretches your brain, it stretches your neurons, your nervous system, it stretches your consciousness. So you start thinking in very different radical ways and very deep ways. So even, even if astrology doesn't lead you to practicing astrology, studying it can open up the depths of your consciousness like nothing else really that I've, I've experienced. So keep this in mind. Okay, so you've got books, you've got teachers, you've got classes, taking your time with each one, and then what it comes down to is just doing astrology. Always start with people that you know. I don't advise using your own chart to study astrology. Why? Because you're more likely to get all caught up in negative meanings or positive meanings and get the wrong information. I've just seen that to be true across the board. It's better to get the chart or charts of people that you know that you can be more objective about because that way you can look and you can say, all right, Saturn's in the sixth house with Mars. Well, how has that played out in their life, specifically during that Saturn and Mars dasha? Versus when you look at your chart and you see Saturn and Mars dasha is coming up and Saturn and Mars is in your sixth house and what are you going to do? Most people are going to freak out. Um, so you got to have some distance and some detachment with your study. And then you start to see how everything works and how it fits together. And then it's easier for you to use your own chart because, again, you have more detachment, more self-knowledge. And then you, you keep doing charts and you keep making mistakes and you keep giving good predictions and you pay attention to the good predictions and you write down how that worked out. And you notice the things where you made enormous errors and then you contemplate, well, how did I miss this? And you go to your books and you study and you ask your teacher and you say, how might I have uh, better assessed this? And you learn in that way. So it takes a lot of patience. It takes the capacity to study the building blocks, one building block at a time. It takes time for you to Commit to memory what the planets mean, even though that's not going to help you interpret a chart right now, this very instant. You learn what the planets mean, then you go learn what the houses mean, even though that's not going to help you this very instant to understand the chart. You commit that to memory. Then you go learn what the nakshatras mean. Then you learn about Rashi aspects and how those work. And even though right now, that information about how the Rashi aspects work are not going to help you read a chart at this very instant. And you go do the same thing with graha aspects, because these are different, and they're very important. And eventually, you get enough of these fundamental building blocks that you can build a little castle. And you can do good astrology. But you have to know all these things individual, individually and how they fit together first. Otherwise, you're going to make a whole bunch of mistakes, and you're going to continue to give astrology a bad name. Uh, and why does astrology have a bad name? Because we don't have a systematic um, way of looking at this. Uh, Brihat Parashara gives that systematic way, but what most people have done is that they have just, they pick and they choose, you know, what techniques they want to use, and that's what they focus on. And I'm guilty of that too, which is why at the beginning of 2016, I'm deciding to start with Brihat Parashara Hora Shastra and teach that on this channel so that in the future, when people ask me about how to study astrology, I can say, you can go take my classes, my MP3 courses. They'll give you very specific information. You can go take Ernst Wilhelm's MP3 courses. Again, all these are on AshevilleVedicAstrology.com under the um, audio and video courses. But before you do that, go take the free 52 series Introduction to Astrology course. Go take the free Brihat Parashara Hora Shastra course. You're probably going to spend three years on that alone. But if you take all those things first, then when you go back and you take these specific courses, they'll make a lot more sense and you'll be able to fit them together. So again, I admit that um, I have been guilty of that as well, of kind of focusing on very specific things. But the reason I know that is because I see how people are just focusing on these one specific subjects at a time. And they're not thinking about it holistically. I was assuming that they would just think about it holistically.
I would assume that they would have read The Art and Science of Vedic Astrology, Volume 1 and Volume 2, and learned all those things independently. Why? Because that is how I did it in the beginning. So I made a poor judgment there. Um, but that's okay. There's time to remedy that. And it's okay to study things in short bursts and little subjects because that adds to your database of knowledge and then eventually once you get enough of these put together you see how it all fits together so I think we're still alright but anyway back to um, my notes let's see so we talked about mastering the fundamentals um, most mistakes are made because our thinking is too simplistic I can't say that enough um, Finally, you need to be patient and take your time with it. I did touch upon this. But to understand an astrological chart, you have to be able to think concretely as well as abstractly, which means you have to be able to look at a chart and say, okay, um, Mars is in uh, three degrees of Taurus, so therefore it's an Amritta, Baladi of Ashtra, it's in a dead state. And then you need to see that, well, Mercury is with Mars, and Mercury is um, in the middle of the sign. It's a yuva avashta. So it has a lot of capacity through lajitati avashtas to starve that Mars. And then you can take it through the Vargas. And so you need to actually be able to think about these things in this kind of concrete way and understand that, okay, well, Mars rules over the first and the, um, the eighth house, and um, Mercury rules over the third and the sixth. So how might that lajitati avashta of starvation towards Mars, how might that be hurting? Well, it can cause health problems because Mars rules the first and the eighth, uh, the body and also our vitality, and Mercury is ruling the third and the sixth. The sixth is a disease-causing um, house, and the third house can give some difficulties with health-related matters or, or uh, proper expression of the body in the world. So just that alone, we get a lot of good information there, but we had to be able to have all that in our mind to think about it concretely. Um, and then we need to kind of expand how we assess these principles because it may be that now you need to look at the transits to see are transits doing anything are they anywhere else in the chart that could trigger this and it might not be obvious it might not just be that Mars is back where it was when you were born and Mercury is right on top of it it might be um, that Saturn's in the eighth house and that has nothing to do with Mercury and Mars at least for our purposes at the moment but the fact that Saturn is in the eighth um, that can show health issues coming up. And maybe by transit, the lord of Saturn, Mars, um, is in um, Aries. Well, now we have a very strong Mars starving that Saturn by transit. So there's all these different connections that have to be made, that have to be sorted through to figure out what's going on. Then we take it to the dashes. So again, we see it takes concrete the brain needs to expand and that's what takes time a lot of people say I can't do this but it's only because they haven't practiced the way you think abstractly and concretely it's a skill that you develop over time everything that I just said if that was sort of felt like it was over your head um, well when I was first learning astrology and I was talking to Richard Fish or even when I have correspondence with David Frawley uh, the things they would say to me about this Lord is in that house, house and the dispositor of this and so on my head just spun because I wasn't used to thinking in that way. So essentially it just takes time for you to learn to think that way. And it might take months, it might take years. And those aha moments that you have after you've studied certain principles, um, that's in a sense when maybe the neural connections are finally being made and now you get it. Aha, there it is. There were numerous uh, techniques that I learned from Richard Fish and Ernst Wilhelm that they told me about them and I said this is crazy there's no way that that makes any sense whatsoever but in time and the more I studied it and the more I saw how it worked then I saw it every single time it just it just clicked into place so you have to be patient with yourself you have to develop the memory so studying develops your memory it expands your conscious capacity um, to think about things you have to practice practice thinking abstractly practice layering the transits over the Rashi into the Vargas with the Dashas. You have to practice doing that even though it's extremely hard at first because 
by practicing doing that, that's how you get better at it. And it just takes time in that regard. Um, I would also like to say that devotion to your studies is most important. Uh, you know, Ganesh is the lord of astrology, the lord of obstacles and the remover of obstacles. In the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, listening to the Om vibration is said to remove all obstacles, is said to attune you to Ishvara. And when you meditate before you study, or when you meditate before you give a session, um, and you do this daily, it in a sense connects you to the source, the direct source knowledge of astrology. You know, we call it Vedic astrology. Um, some people dispute that there is a Vedic astrology, that it's just a term that um, was popular, uh, made popular in the 80s and the 90s, and maybe that's true. But we can remember what the Vedas actually are, and that that is self-revealed knowledge. It's very easy to say all these sages thousands of years ago had the self-revealed knowledge, but now we can't have it. Well, that's, that's a silly thing to think about. The more devotion, the more sincere, sincerity you have, the more you study with a, a sattvic intent, then certain techniques just kind of blossom in your consciousness. Um, you know, it can be the neural pathways being connected, but there have been many times when I've been meditating, and all of a sudden, it just occurred to me, ah, well, this is how I use that particular varga. Sure, I'd heard about this, I'd read about it, I'd tried to apply it, but now it became a, an aha moment, a very real experience. And so that is, in a sense, how a person can experience self-revealed knowledge. So if we want to make Vedic astrology, Vedic astrology, then we need to have a sense of devotion to the practice, to the study. Um, we need to be very curious about it. We need to be inspired and just enjoy it as we learn. And don't do it because we're afraid of the bad planets. And don't do it because we want to make our life perfect. When you do it because you're afraid of bad planets, uh, you're, you've got a Tomasic mindset. When you're doing it because you want to manage your entire life, you know you really want to plan it out so everything's 100% certain all the time, um, then you, you've got a Rajasic approach to it. In my experience, the best astrology occurs when the client has done their very best to figure something out on their own. They've used their God-given will, their God-given intellect, and they just can't figure it out. So then they approach an astrologer with sincerity. And then astrologer looks at the chart, he reveals some trends, he says, okay, now work with that. And the person makes great progress in that regard. The worst kind of astrology is when people want 100% certainty of um, this happening or that happening. And I'm not a fatalistic astrologer. I'm not a fatalistic astrologer. I see trends, and I like to encourage people who learn from me to look at trends. Now, given certain trends will be stronger than others, um, but if you don't lock into this is most definitely going to happen. You don't want to make a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, I think you're working, uh, in my mind as an astrologer should, not to encourage people to be afraid, not to encourage people to try to control and micromanage every aspect of God's creation in their life, because what does that rob us of? That robs us of that uh, capacity for surrender. And we have to remember Saturn is a very important aspect within astrology for nothing else than to show us what the inevitable is, those things we cannot overcome, those areas that we have to surrender in. And that is the areas, th those are the areas where our hearts get broken open. And those are the areas where we experience greater clarity and peace and joy when we do surrender because our, our negative ego has been destroyed in that regard. And Saturn, you can't control that. Um... You can appease Saturn, you can learn to benefit from what he wants you to learn, but the more you try to force and control and be the doer in your life situation, as though you know there's not any grace available, or as though um, you can know everything and read every particular trend and, and mathematically calculate to the very day when something's going to happen, I do believe that's possible, um, but I don't, I, don't, I don't personally like doing that because it takes away your own free will. That's why when I do 12 months 12 month reports for people, I don't like to just look at the chart and go through um, specific transits. I like to know what are your, uh, what's the word? What are your mm, goals and intentions for the year? 
because the more intentional you can be, the more goals you can have, uh, then we can see the trends to see how you can ride that a little bit better. Um, but I don't like to be fatalistic and say, you know, this period of time, just pack it in, you're done. Uh, when I see transits or difficult periods like that, I provide remedial measures and I give insights into what to watch for, but I'm not ever going to tell anyone uh, this is 100% certain, for good or for bad, because it really depends upon how you as the individual respond to your own chart. Otherwise, this is an automated system, and why bother anyway? Because what's going to happen is going to happen, so why even approach an astrologer? So the more you study astrology, try to approach it from this level of devotion, of understanding trends and possibilities and more self-knowledge, and less from uh, you want to transform the world or control and micromanage all of God's creation. You know, Some people do that. So anyway, these are some thoughts on astrology and how to study astrology. Um, again, this year... I do have a few more classes that we're going to go through before I get to Brihat Parashar, Hora Shastra. Uh, they're all webinars. Um, the next class will be the Atmakarika and Relationships class, which will be, I believe, a seven-week class this summer, meeting on Wednesday evenings at 6.30 Eastern time zone. So you can write, uh, write to us if you want to participate in that. Again, it's limited to 24 people. There is the fall semester coming up, which will focus on Jaimini techniques, uh, Avashtas, timing. You can find more information on that at astralvedicastrology.com. And then before the end of the year, we'll be concluding these webinar series that I've been working on these past four or five years, or three to five years, I don't know however long it's been, um, on the nakshatras. And after that, we're getting back to basics, starting at the very beginning and building it up from there. So hopefully this was helpful for you. Um, it's a pleasure to talk to you again. And... Good luck on your studies, be sincere, be curious, and let your, let your work be inspired. Follow your heart in that regard. It's a wonderful system to help you not only understand yourself, astrology, but to understand or get a, just a little glimpse in regards to the cosmic cycles. It's, it's really beautiful. So anyway, be well, and we'll be in touch soon. Thanks.